Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I'm very happy to have Dahlia Barron with us today. Hey, Dahlia. Hi, Frank. It's very nice to be here. Ev, thank you so much for agreeing to talk about your really lovely article. It's very nice. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. And Dahlia, where, where are you located at? What's your geolocation? I'm located uh, in Tel Aviv. I'm uh, a PhD student in Tel Aviv University. So I live uh, in the city, in the center of uh, Tel Aviv. Okay, very cool. Uh, how far along are you in your PhD trajectory? First year, second year, third year? I am expected to finish this summer. Uh, oh. I'm currently writing the uh, research statement for all the fellowships, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations on being close. I, I look forward to uh, calling you Dr. Barron. Thank that. you. Yes, it very will good. be very exciting. <laughs> it will be very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is awesome. That is so awesome. So Tel Aviv, we are a little bit closer to the equator than I am in Phoenix, and it is October 18th, 2021, as we do this recording. Um, and so fall has definitely hit here in Phoenix. We've turned the knob down a little bit on the temperature. Um, and so how about in Tel Aviv? Is it, is it snowing yet in Tel Aviv? <laughs> um, no, so it isn't snowing yet. Um, but temperatures uh, started to be more handleable. Mm -hmm. uh, the humidity is still uh, very high, so mm -hmm. it's still difficult to be outside uh, for long. But we're now we're we're going into the fall. I know it because I'm I'm a runner, and now I can go for a run uh, after the sunrise, uh, which I wasn't uh, able to do a month ago, for example. So temperatures are going down finally. Awesome. Um, so what kind of running do you do? Do you do like marathons, half marathons, sprints? So my first marathon is going to be in two weeks. Uh, I have been uh, working towards that for the past several months. So I'm very excited about that. It very was cool. extremely difficult. Very cool. uh, yes. So in two weeks, I, uh, I will hopefully complete my first one. That is so nice. Uh, well, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, I hope you, uh, you do well, however you define that. That's perfectly good. So, And I wish you um, many more happy marathons. I think that's really nice. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Uh, Dahlia, what do you like to do for research? Um, so I focus mostly on uh, two topics. Um, the first and uh, the largest one uh, is the impact of active galactic nuclei uh, on their host galaxies. Okay. I'm mostly an astronomer, so I observe uh, multi-phased outflows in active galaxies and I construct models uh, to, to basically extract their properties. Um, so this is one type of thing I do. And another thing I'm doing uh, is more related to statistical tools and machine learning uh, applications to astronomical data sets, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, more in line with the paper we're going to discuss today. That is well, that's a nice duo to have, both observer and machine learning capabilities. It's really which interesting. Is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ article, extracting the main trend in the data set, the sequencer algorithm. And Dahlia, take us away. Thank you, Frank. Um, so uh, I'll start. Uh, so this work was done in a collaboration with Professor Brice Menard, who uh, is a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked on it uh, for several years, and uh, we enjoyed it very much. I think this is uh, one of the uh, most fun projects uh, I was involved in. Um, and it's uh, more about a tool than about a scientific result, although I'll show some scientific results towards the end of the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and I think I'll uh, start with the introduction. Um, and let's start very generally. So our basic goal as scientists is to extract simplicity from the observed complex universe. 
we observe this very complicated phenomena and processes and we try to build physical laws, simple physical laws uh, that can describe this complexity. So the law of gravitation, uh, Maxwell laws, for example, uh, they're built in order to uh, describe as simply as possible a wide range of uh, observables that we have. So this is in general what we try to do as scientists. And we have two ways uh, in which we can do that. Uh, the first one is theory driven. Uh, we're trying to build physical models uh, that will uh, describe the observations that we have and perhaps predict some new uh, observations that we didn't obtain yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the other type of, uh, of extraction of simplicity we can do is using data sets, using experimental data or observations where we perform data exploration with the goal of finding trends, finding some simple uh, trends in our data set and from this extract meaning that will allow us to constrain our physical models. Okay. Um, so this paper is about the data exploration part and there are various ways to, uh, to attempt and explore our data set. Uh, the challenge in recent years is that, first of all, our data sets uh, become larger and larger. We have millions of spectra, billions of images, billions of uh, uh, measurements uh, of stars in our Milky Way. Um, so the data sets become uh, very huge. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to that, our data sets become more and more complex. So the amount of information I have for a single object uh, increases uh, dramatically as a function. Uh, so basically in the past uh, two decades, where now we can have a case where we have hundreds to thousands of features measured per object. So for example, uh, a spectrum, uh, we can have hundreds or thousands of uh, flux values at given wavelengths or uh, pixels in an image, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And this complexity uh, is the real challenge when we try to explore our data sets, because we cannot visualize a very complicated data set. We can visualize things in two or three dimensions, but not much more. And the question is, how can we take these complex data sets and explore them? And one option to do that is using dimensionality reduction algorithms. Uh, I'm listing here several examples. Uh, the most popular one is principal component analysis, PCA. Uh, there are uh, more uh, recent methods such as Disney and UMAP, uh, which gained uh, popularity in recent years. And what these algorithms do they take these uh, complex high dimensional objects and they embed them into a lower dimensional space, mm -hmm. trying to preserve as much of the information uh, about these objects as possible. So if I have a spectrum of a star, for example, with thousands of flux values, I can use PCA or TSNI or UMAP to represent this stellar spectrum as a coordinate in a two dimensional space. And this allows me to visualize my data and explore it, look for trends in this representation and try to extract meaning from them. Um, but it's important to understand that these algorithms do not replace the scientist. So this is only the first step uh, in the data exploration process. And it's important to understand that this step includes numerous choices we have to make. And these choices are unfortunately domain specific. Uh, one such choice we need to make, which is uh, the basic choice we need uh, to make for all dimensionality reduction algorithms is the way we measure similarity or distance between objects. So, uh, for example, I know that three is closer to four and is farther away from 10. But now I have two optical spectra of stars. Are they similar? Are they dissimilar? How do I define distances between them? Right. And in most of the cases, uh, the default choice will be the Euclidean metric. 
the L2 norm, where mm -hmm. I basically uh, perform a pairwise subtraction uh, and then I uh, take it to the power of two, sum it all up and take a square root. But there are many other metrics uh, which might be uh, more relevant to the specific project or specific question I have in mind. So this is one choice we need to make. Uh, in addition to that, we can, uh, we can ask where the relevant information is. Sometimes the important information will be on small scales in the data, while in other cases, it will be on larger scales. If again, we'll take the example of uh, spectrum, uh, emission and absorption lines are information on small scales. Only a handful amount of features or flux values carry this information, whereas the continuum emission is some large scale information. So where should we concentrate? Should we look at small scales, at larger scales, at medium scales? All of these things are extremely domain specific and they depend on the type of objects that I have and my physical knowledge of these objects. So I need to understand these things. And in addition to that, uh, most dimensionality reduction algorithms also have several hyperparameters that we need uh, to define before we can apply these algorithms. So uh, let's take Disney, for example. Disney has two hyperparameters, one that is called perplexity, another that is called learning rate. It doesn't really matter what they do, but uh, what, what's important is that I need to set them to some value in order to apply Disney to my data set. And the challenge is, that for different choices of hyperparameters, I will get a different embedding in two dimensions. Yes. And since we do not know what are the correct hyperparameters to choose, uh, there is sort of an, more of an art uh, than a science here. We do a trial and error. And basically for different iterations, we choose different hyperparameters. We examine the embedding. We try to understand what makes sense, what, uh, what uh, resonates with the physics of the system and things like this. And then we choose the hyperparameters. Uh, so this work is uh, extremely challenging and we need to have a lot of domain knowledge. We need to understand what are the objects in our data set, where is the relevant information and how is it captured? And all of that we do before we perform the data exploration. Yes. And my question is, or our question here in the paper, is whether we can build an algorithm that will be able to generically identify trends in the data set without this prior knowledge uh, about the objects in the sample, without understanding different distance matrix, without knowing where on which scale the information is and what hyperparameters we should choose. And Thus, we can apply this algorithm to data sets we know very little about. Oh. So this is our basic question. And in this paper, uh, we present the sequencer, which is an algorithm that attempts to detect a one-dimensional trend, a sequence in the data set. And I would argue that sequences are abound in astronomy. So, in astronomy, in many cases, uh, we have uh, some leading parameters such as the mass, the effective temperature, the redshift, the luminosity. And when I change them, I will expect to find a continuous change in my observables, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, if we think about uh, stellar spectra, if we change the temperature, we will see a continuum emission that changes uh, various absorption lines that appear and disappear. And all of that happens as a function of this leading parameter, with, which is the temperature. Okay. And although the Although the sequence is the one dimensional trend, so it's the simplest trend you can think of, mm -hmm. it can be manifested in the data in a very complex manner. Many things can change over different scales in a nonlinear way. So it's, uh, it can be challenging to detect it. Mm -hmm. um, and basically in this paper, we try to do that uh, uh, by uh, 
constructing the sequencer algorithm. And I will go to few details, uh, which I uh, think are important in the sequencer algorithm. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the second page, uh, to figure one. Spanning trees. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Um, so this is the basis of the algorithm. Um, so imagine that I have a data set. Uh, and let's assume that I have a way to measure similarities or distances between the objects in the sample. Uh, for example, the Euclidean distance, but it can be any distance we want. So I'm, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm estimating distances between all the objects in my sample, and this results in a distance matrix where every cell in the distance matrix represents the distance between two objects in my data set. Now I can equivalently represent this distance matrix as a fully connected graph. Yes. A fully connected graph consists of nodes. Every such node represents an object in my sample. And this object is connected via edges to all the other nodes. This is why it is called a fully connected graph because there is a, an edge between every uh, pair of nodes in my data set. And this edge represents the distance between these two objects. So this distance matrix and the fully connected graph are equivalent uh, properties of the data. Okay. And this fully connected graph uh, incorporates a lot of relevant information about the structure of my data. And in particular, I can calculate a very important property of graphs that is called the minimum spanning tree. Mm -hmm. A minimum spanning tree of a fully connected graph is basically a skeleton. It's the minimal structure I can build from this graph in which I can still go from every node to every other node in the data set mm -hmm. via some path. And the sum of the edges that remained in this minimum spanning tree is minimal, which means that the total distance of all the edges is minimal. Okay. Now, the cool thing is that this minimum spanning tree is unique and we know how to estimate it for every fully connected graph that we have. And the reason why we're interested in these minimum spanning trees is because they trace valuable information about the topology of the data, about the structure of the data. Mm -hmm. And in figure one, I'm showing uh, three examples of uh, minimum spanning trees. Uh, if we look at the, uh, at the panel on the left, this is a minimum spanning tree of a random graph. A data set uh, which is basically random and you can see this is uh, what the minimum spanning tree looks like. In the middle panel I'm showing you a data set that has some sequence in it but also some noise mm -hmm. and this is its minimum spanning tree. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, in the right panel, I'm showing you a data set which has a perfect sequence in it without any noise or any scatter. Mm -hmm. And this is its minimum spanning tree. Okay. And what we can see from this example is that when my data set has a strong, a significant one dimensional trend in it, the minimum spanning tree tends to be elongated. Mm -hmm. So I'm calculating the fully connected graph and then the minimum spanning tree and this skeleton, this backbone of my graph, it appears extremely elongated, which means that the objects have some sort of natural ordering inside them, okay. inside the data set. Cool. Um, and this is the, base, the basis of our algorithm. If we have a minimum spanning tree, and it is elongated, it means that there is a one dimensional trend, a sequence in the data. And if the minimum spanning tree is not elongated, we do not detect any sequence in the data. Okay. And this elongation, one can estimate it via various ways. In our particular case, we estimate the minor axis and the major axis of the, uh, of the graph of the minimum spanning tree, and then define the elongation as the major axis divided by the minor axis, basically. Okay. 
Mm. And you can see uh, I indicated the elongation that we measure for these three graphs. So uh, for the left uh, panel, uh, it's uh, an, an elongation of eight. Uh, in the middle panel, it's an elongation of 27. And in the right panel, it's an elongation of, seven, uh, of uh, 50. So uh, this is the most important parameter uh, in our algorithm. Okay. And basically, it gives us a figure of merit. It gives us a score. Now, I can examine different distance metrics, different uh, scales, examining different scales of the problem, iterate over all the hyperparameters, okay. and estimate a distance matrix estimate a minimum spanning tree of the fully connected graph, and then ask what is its elongation. So instead of doing this uh, trial and error and checking by eye, I have a concrete score, which is well-defined for every data set I have. Cool. This is basically uh, the algorithm. Uh, so uh, here I, I, I told you uh, the, the basic principle. Uh, if we'll go to the next page uh, and the next section, uh, there are a few details about the algorithm itself I, uh, I want to briefly mention. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so I will not go into every detail and every uh, line of uh, pseudocode that we have here because I think this is less interesting. I will just give a brief overview of the things that I uh, think that are uh, worthwhile uh, in this algorithm. Cool, okay. So, so we use this elongation and it allows us to examine different distance matrix, different scales, and using this elongation, we can extract, identify the best metric and the best scale through which a sequence is most apparent. Okay. So this is what we're trying to do. And to do that, our algorithm uses, uh, examines four different uh, distance metrics, four different uh, approaches to assign distances between objects. Okay. I list them at the second paragraph in 3.1. Um, so we use the Euclidean distance, which is the default distance uh, studies usually use. Uh, we use the KL divergence, the kullback leibler uh, divergence, which is also called the relative entropy. This is a rather popular uh, distance uh, measure in uh, information theory and computer science. Mm -hmm. It allows us to check uh, if we compare two probability distribution functions, it allows us to check by how much one probability distribution function diverges from the other. So it allows us to measure distances between vectors in, uh, uh, in, in a very interesting way. Cool. Now, it's important to note that both the Euclidean distance and the KL divergence are insensitive to the x-axis, basically to the coordinates on which our objects lie. Okay. So for example, let us, see, let us uh, think again uh, about uh, st stellar spectra. Um, so I can estimate the uh, Euclidean distance between two spectra, okay. and then I can take this spectra and I can shuffle the different wavelengths. So instead of uh, showing them uh, as a flux as a function of wavelength where the wavelength increases monotonically, I can shuffle the wavelength. The Euclidean distance will remain the same. Yes. It doesn't care about the shuffling because it only cares about the relative differences between the flux values in each wavelength. Uh -huh. Now, this is not, uh, not the best, uh, not, not the optimal uh, way to extract information when the x-axis has some meaning, like wavelength. So yes. we know, for example, an emission line, for example, is an information that we see on uh, several uh, wavelengths. So we want to somehow take this into account. Mm -hmm. And for that, we included two very interesting distance metrics. The first one is called the Earth Movers Distance, EMD. Mm -hmm. And the second one is called energy distance. Mm -hmm. I will just note briefly that the earth movers distance is a very popular distance uh, measure in computer vision uh, because it, uh, it corresponds 
to our visual perception of images. So if I'll give you uh, mm -hmm. 10 images and I will ask you to find the images that are most similar to uh, another image I'll give you, and you will do, uh, you will do this, uh, we will find that uh, the ordering you did and the selection you did uh, closely matches the distances assigned by the earth movers distance. Okay. And the cool thing about these two metrics is that they are sensitive to this x-axis. Yep. So if you shuffle the different uh, features, the order, you will get a different result, which means that the information about uh, how things move from one uh, feature to the next is encoded within this distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we'll go to the result, I will explain why this is important, or I will show uh, examples where this is important. Okay. So these are the four uh, distance metrics that we consider, but it's important to note that one can add any additional uh, metric uh, they want, basically. Uh, it can be general, we can examine even 20, 40 metrics, uh, how, um, however you want. And the second thing we do is we examine the data on different scales. As I told you before, sometimes the relevant information will be on smaller scales, whereas in other cases, the relevant information will be on larger scales. Mm -hmm. And in order to uh, capture this with the algorithm, we take each object and we divide. And we lost somebody. <clears throat> okay, we'll wait a minute. Maybe it should come back. Okay, I'm gonna. Hello, I think I'm back. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> all good. Uh, yes, he told me that the connection is unstable. Yeah. Uh, where uh, did you lose me? Uh, I lost you right about where you were going to uh, take each object and sort of divide it by the total. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes. So uh, I'm taking each object and instead of considering the full object, I can divide it into segments. So I can divide it into two segments and then I can examine the objects, compare the different objects as seen only in the first segment or only in the second segment. So this is what happens when I have two segments, but I can divide the object into many, many small segments and examine, compare the objects in these uh, tiny segments. And in this case, I'm basically zooming in into small scale information because I'm looking at very uh, small parts of my data, my uh, feature space. So the way we do that, we consider an object as a whole, we divide it into two segments, four segments, eight segments, 16 segments, et cetera, et cetera. Basically mm -hmm. in, a, uh, in a two to the power of L uh, mm -hmm. until we reach uh, roughly 20 pixels. Now this again meant to be as generic as possible, but one can change the scales as well in the algorithm and the online interface. Okay. And now once we have defined a set of metrics and a set of scales, what I'm going to do, I'm going for each metric and for each selected scale, I'm going to examine, basically measure distances between these segments on all the various segments, compute the minimum spanning tree, examine its elongation, and aggregate the information from all the different segments into a single minimum spanning tree. Yes. Uh, which encodes the information for a given scale and a given metric. Okay. And then I can examine different scale, different, uh, different scales, different metrics. And using an aggregated minimum spanning tree, I can then basically extract the final sequence in my data where this aggregation is a weighted average according to the elongation. So metrics and scales which found a more significant sequence and thus uh, get a larger elongation parameter will contribute more to the final sequence. Yeah. 
okay. and metrics and scales which did not will con contribute less. And this is how I aggregate all of this information to obtain my final minimum spanning tree, okay. my final elongation. Okay. And from this minimum spanning tree, I extract my final sequence. Okay. And just a note about the sequence extraction. So uh, uh, can you please go back to figure one for a second? I will. A little bit of a bandwidth delay, it's all good. That's okay. Great, thank you. Um, so if we concentrate on the middle panel again, imagine that this is uh, indeed my minimum spanning tree. And now the question is how do I order the objects from this minimum spanning tree? Uh, as I, uh, as I uh, said before, every node is an object. And we can walk within this uh, minimum spanning tree in different ways. And the way we do that is uh, using the breadth first search algorithm, where we basically we start with the least central point, which can be either at the bottom or at the top. Right. And then we scan the nodes as a function of the distance from the center and assign the ordering by that, basically. Okay. So we search it uh, with a breadth first search and uh, thus obtaining the final sequence. Um, so this is uh, all I wanted to say about the algorithm. Okay. Uh, and I'll be happy to show you a few uh, results to show you uh, what, what, can, what this algorithm can do. Cool. Um, so I'll be happy if you can uh, move to figure two. There we go, looks like a spectra. Yes, <clears throat> great. Um, so what you're seeing here, this is a simulated data set where I control every aspect of it. Uh, and this is the first test we wanted to perform. So I constructed these one dimensional objects. You can see a sample of these objects at the upper left panel. You can see uh, what I basically simulated are one dimensional objects, which have uh, each object has four Gaussians, which are located at different uh, uh, locations uh, in the X axis. So this is one thing that happens there. And on top of that, I added large scale noise, uh -huh. uh, which I constructed using a Gaussian process. And in the Gaussian process, I can, uh, I can define the scale on which uh, we have fluctuations. So you can see that in some of the objects, the fluctuations are large scales. We see changes uh, that are very smooth as a function of the X coordinate. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other cases, for example, the the, yes, exactly this one. So here, the changes are very rapid. So we have this noise fluctuations on different scales. Yes. Now on the upper right panel, I'm showing you a visualization of the entire data set where each row represents an object and the cells are color coded by the relative intensity. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this data set as is, it is difficult to understand what is going on there. It's difficult to understand whether there is a trend, what does it uh, does this data include, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and we can use this data set as an input to the sequencer algorithm. Yeah. And the sequencer uh, constructs minimum spanning trees, optimizes over different metrics, different scales, extracts the final sequence, and then it reorders the objects in the data set according to the detected sequence. So there isn't any manipulation on the flux values that you see or the intensity values. All I did was reorder the different rows according to the detected sequence. Yep. And what we find is this very nice W shape uh, that, uh, that I constructed using these four Gaussians. This is something that we couldn't see in the original randomly ordered data set. And here, once the sequencer was applied to the data set, it's very easy to see that there is a very significant one dimensional trend there. Uh, for comparison, I'm showing you the results by Tisney and Umap, uh -huh. uh, two very popular dimensionality reduction algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, where I take the initial data set, I embed it into a single dimension, 
And I rank order the objects according to this dimension, and these are the resulting uh, sequences, basically. Mm -hmm. And what you can see is that neither TISNI nor UMAP detected this sequence, but they detected something. You can see that there is a variation in the large scale changes, the large scale fluctuations of the noise I added. So this is what TISNI and UMAP pick up, and the reason is, uh, the reason why the sequencer worked here while TISNI and UMAP haven't is that we have a multi-scaled approach. The sequencer knows how to zoom in to the relevant scale on which the information is. And in this particular case, the information is on small scales. And this is, an, this is something that TISNI and UMAP do not know, but the sequencer is optimized for. Um, let's go to figure three. Uh, where I show, I think, with the visual example, why it is so important to examine different metrics and different scales. Mm -hmm. um, as observers, we know that some tools work, some tools do not work. We know that for particular sources we observe, there are uh, specific wavelengths uh, we should concentrate on, but what happens when we do not have this information? So what I'm showing here, I'm showing the resulting uh, intermediate products of the sequencer, the intermediate sequences okay. for different distance metrics mm -hmm. and for different scales. Mm -hmm. So on the y-axis, I'm showing the different distances we consider. And uh, above each box plot, we have this L parameter, which uh, represents the scale uh, on which we see uh, through which we see the data. L equals zero means large scales. It okay. means that I consider the entire object as a single entity. Okay. L equals one means that I uh, break each object into two segments. Yes. L equals three, it's four segments, etc., etc. So as L increases, I concentrate on smaller and smaller scales. Yes. And the x-axis shows the elongation of the minimum spanning tree obtained for these metrics and these scales. And what we can see is that for small scales, for all distance metrics that we use, uh, we get a very small elongation parameter. We get 11 and five and nine and eight, and the resulting ordering is not very informative. We do not find a strong sequence in the data. Right. But we can see that as I uh, increase the scale, I'm going to L equals four or L equals five for the Euclidean distance and the KL divergence on the right. Yeah. Suddenly, I'm getting this booming elongations and I'm able to detect the sequence. So this is exactly the connection between the elongation and our optimization of the metrics and the scales. Basically, by, uh, by studying the elongation and considering it, we're able to optimize over these hyperparameters and avoid domain-specific choices. Well, I'm with you. Very nice. Great. Um, so this is all I wanted to say about the algorithm. And now I wanted to show you results uh, from actual real data sets. Um, so I'll be happy if you can move on to figure four. Okay, there we go. Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, so this, uh, this is a very complicated figure, but I'll try to break it up uh, and explain it uh, slowly. So here I'm showing you four different data sets, four real data sets. Um, each row represents a different data set. The first data set I'm showing are optical spectra of stars from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So on the leftmost panel, I'm showing you uh, uh, a random sample of the objects in the sample. So you can see this optical spectra. You can see uh, our familiar uh, black body emission, uh, familiar absorption lines, right. some Balmer lines, some uh, metal absorption lines, etc. Yep. And the next panel shows, visualizes the entire data set where, again, every row represents a stellar spectrum. Yes. where each cell is color coded by the relative flux. Yes. And this data is randomly ordered and this is the input to the sequencer. Mm -hmm. And the output is shown on the right. And again, 
All the sequencer does uh, is detect the sequence, reorder the objects in the data set according to the sequence, and this is what we see. And I, I find this amazing because when we do this process, meaning emerges. We see these diagrams on the right and we immediately understand what is going on. So if we look at the bottom of the plot, we see uh, that the sequence is dominated by hot stars. We see blue continuum emission. We see uh, the beginning of uh, Balmer lines. And as we move in the sequence, we're moving to colder and colder stars. So from O stars, we go to, uh, to B and A, et cetera, et cetera. And everything changes in a continuous manner. So the continuum emission changes. Emission line, uh, absorption lines appear and reappear in a continuous manner as well. And I think that this is one of the best examples that we have uh, for a case where when we order a data set, which appears extremely complex uh, initially when we do not understand it, and once we've ordered it and understood that the leading parameter is the effective temperature, mm -hmm we learn something about the objects. We, we understand some physics. So this entire complexity can be attributed to a single parameter, the effective temperature. Mm -hmm. And this is a very strong constraint on our physical models. And this is basically what happened when the HR diagram was discovered, basically. Right. Um, so yeah. the sequencer was able to reproduce it, luckily for yeah. us. Very good. Uh, yes. So this is the first example. Uh, the second data set I'm showing, these are optical spectra of quasars, again, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, mm -hmm. but they are in observer frame. I do not correct them for redshift. Right. And you can see a sample of the uh, randomly ordered data set and the, uh, and the entire uh, data set visualized. Yep. And on the right, we can see the output of the sequencer. And what we see, we see that uh, we have these uh, very bright stripes moving across wavelengths. Mm. And these are basically strong emission lines, which are redshifted because of the redshift. So the sequencer was able to detect uh, the redshift of the object. And on the right, we see uh, uh, a random sample from the order data set. And what's important to note here mm -hmm. is that the emission lines of quasars are different. They have different properties. In some quasars, the emission lines are broader. In others, the emission lines are narrower. The emission line ratios are different. The continuum emission changes. So there is a lot of variation that is completely irrelevant to the sequence. Yeah. But the sequencer was able to, uh, to, to neglect this information, to not take it into account, and basically focus only on the scales and the information in which we see this one dimensional trend. So although most of the pixels in the quasar spectrum do not carry a relevant information for the sequence, the sequencer was able to detect this, uh, this redshift sequence. And another very important uh, aspect of this diagram is that most of the dimensionality reduction algorithms uh, we uh, use, such as PCA, TSNI, UMAP, in their default uh, setting, yes. cannot detect something like this. They cannot detect how information shifts from one feature to the next. And this is because they're using the Euclidean distance. And in this particular case, we need to use metrics such as the earth movers distance, which is sensitive mm -hmm. to how information moves from one pixel to the next. Uh, the next example I'm showing are uh, rest frame spectra of broad absorption line quasars, mm -hmm. uh, which are very interesting uh, subpopulation of quasars where we see uh, UV emission lines originating from the accretion this uh, from the broadline region, sorry. But in addition to these emission lines, we see very broad absorption features, which are blue shifted with respect to the emission lines. Yes. So in some of the diagrams, we can see that. 
So we took this data set, applied the sequencer to it, and you can see the results on the right. Now, this sequence is uh, noisier uh, because there are a lot of things going on uh, and the, the, the signal to noise is not very good. So after uh, reordering the objects according to the sequence, we also smoothed the image. So we applied the median filter along the sequence direction. Okay. This allows us to boost the, the sequence, we can see it uh, e in more easily than if we wouldn't have uh, applied this median filter. And what we see in the ordered data set, we see these uh, very bright uh, lines uh, that do not change as a function of wavelength. Yep. So the yellow ones and the red ones, mm. and we see to the left of them, blue shifted from them, we see this black bands. Uh, these black bands uh, represent the absorption lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we can see is that uh, in the bottom of the sequence, we see absorption lines which are attached to the remission line, meaning that the absorption starts right after the emission line. Whereas at the top, we see that there is some wavelength difference between the emission and the absorption. What we see here are basically two classes of broad absorption line quasars, uh, the attached absorption line quasars at the bottom and the detached absorption line quasars uh, at the top. These are well-known classes of these absorbers. And you can see that not only the sequencer was able to cluster, to basically classify them into these two groups, yep. in each group, it has a sequence uh, that is dominated by the width of the broad absorption line and the distance of this broad absorption line from its uh, emission line center. So this is what the sequencer uh, was able to do for this data set. And the coolest example uh, is the fourth one uh, of Einstein's uh, face. Yes. And this example is very important because the three examples I shown you uh, previously are relatively so, in astronomy in general, our objects are simple enough for us to construct parametric models that can predict and describe the objects in our sample. I can construct a model uh, that will have five parameters, 10 parameters, 50 parameters, but I will have this parametric model which will allow me to uh, to model stellar spectra and quasar spectra and even broad absorption line quasar spectra. But when we look at examples from the natural world, natural images, the complexity is so high that it is very difficult to build a model that will be able to describe the objects in the sample. And you can see it in the bottom left panel where I'm showing uh, random uh, examples of the rows uh, in Einstein's face. And you can see that it's extremely difficult to try and build a model, a parametric model that will describe these variations. Yeah. And indeed, when we look at this random, uh, randomly ordered data set, we see nothing there. But once we apply the sequencer to it, meaning emerges, we immediately see Einstein's face. So the sequencer would, was able to detect the very strong and significant uh, sequence uh, of Einstein's face and reorder the objects in the sample according to it small scale yeah uh -huh. very nice yes uh yes so these are uh, several examples uh from the real world and the last example i wanted to show uh it's in figure five where i where we show that one can use the sequencer results Yes. as a color bar, basically to assign colors. So for example, if I have a bunch of objects and these objects are also linked to some spatial coordinate, uh, some actual location, whether uh, right ascension declination or uh, geolocation uh, on earth, for example, I can use the sequencer in order uh, to visualize the map using a color bar. And I will show you here what I mean. So in this particular example, mm -hmm. we used uh, information uh, taken from 14,000 
seismographs that are uh, basically uh, located in different regions in the United States. Mm -hmm. And during an earthquake, all these seismographs record the waves uh, of the earthquake coming towards them. And okay. one can estimate various properties of these waves. In particular, uh, we can estimate uh, the phase velocity of the love waves. Uh, please don't ask me what it is. Um, but this is uh, something that uh, people in seismology work with. Mm -hmm. And this is the data set that you see in the leftmost panel. So you see these, uh, the phase velocities of the love uh, waves uh, for different periods. So this is a data set uh, that people from seismology work with. And it's important to note that every object was recorded in a particular location in the US. So we apply uh, the sequencer to this data set and the output, the ordered data set is shown uh, in the middle panel uh, mm -hmm. where, where we can see that there is some detected sequence there. Uh, mm -hmm. And an important thing I forgot to mention is that these waves that the seismographs record, uh, they are uh, sensitive to the structure, the crustal structure of earth. So depending on the composition, the rock composition of uh, these different regions uh, under the United States, we will get different patterns of waves. So through these uh, waves, we can basically study the inner structure of Earth. Mm -hmm. So we have this older data set, and now I know that objects that are located at the bottom of the sequence are similar to each other in some sense. Mm -hmm. And objects that are located at the top of the sequence are similar to each other uh, in a different sense or in the same sense. So we have this one dimensional sequence. We can assign colors, a one dimensional, uh, basically a color bar to the sequence such that objects that sit closer to the sequence, uh, closer in the sequence will get the same color and yep. objects that sit farther away will get a different color. Mm -hmm. So we go back to the map of the United States. Mm -hmm. And now for each location of seismograph, we color it according to its location in the sequence. And voila, we see lots of stuff. First of all, we see that there is some coherent ordering there. Mm -hmm. We see that there are regions, for example, Florida is green. And then there is a sharp change into pink color. So, this again tells us that the structure, the crustal structure of, of the earth beneath the United States in these regions is different. Yeah. So we see that and we can learn a lot about the different regions in the United States. Now, interestingly, the black thick line that uh, you see plotted on top of the colors, mm -hmm. this is a map of geographic patterns uh, that was created in 1928, uh, which is based on the rock composition on top of the earth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in some cases, there is an amazing correspondence between what we see on top of the earth uh -huh. and what we see in the crustal structure, whereas in other regions, there are differences. So we can learn a lot from this type of representation and just to uh, make it more familiar to astronomers. So when we use integral field data, for example, and we have spectra as a function of a coordinate, uh, or we have a spectra of stars in our own Milky Way with the right ascension and declination, we can apply the sequencer and then color uh, maps in astronomy according uh, to these sequences and detect various uh, uh, structures in two dimensions, basically. Um, so this is this example. Um, and this is basically it about the algorithm. I will note uh, several final things. Uh, first of all, uh, we have already applied this algorithm to two data sets. And uh, this led to two new discoveries. Uh, so in astronomy, we apply this algorithm to spectra of quasars type 1 AGN. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And using the detected sequence, we found a new previously unknown correlation between different emission line properties in AGN. Nice. And apparently we can use this correlation in order to estimate the black hole mass of supermassive black holes mm -hmm. in obscured type two AGN. So this is something that was not possible up until now. And all the details are uh, presented in Baron and Menau 2019. Um, so this is one uh, discovery that uh, was made possible with the sequencer. The second one was in geology. Uh, where we detected three-dimensional structures near the core mental uh, boundary, basically. Um, and it's important to note that in both of these cases, we're not talking about new data sets. We're talking about data sets that were public and there for tens of years. And these sequences or trends were not detected because they are manifested in complicated manners in the data. And if you do not search specifically for something very specific, you cannot extract it. So this can be used to find new things in existing data sets. Um, I think that I, I said the most important things, at least in my eyes. I will also note that we performed here a more uh, extensive comparison to the popular algorithms Disney and UMAP. And we also show how this elongation parameter, which is cardinal in our work, how it can be used to optimize the hyperparameters of Disney and UMAP. Mm -hmm. And basically removing the need of us to explore these things manually. Um, the entire code is available uh, at this GitHub repository. Uh, I have many notebooks there that show different examples of how the code can be used. And in addition to that, we have an online interface where you can upload your data and the web service will order it for you and will email you once uh, a sequence is detected. Um, so this is all uh, free uh, for use. Uh, and I really hope that uh, people uh, will uh, try and use it and apply it to their data sets. That is so awesome. That is great. Dahlia, thank you so much for walking us through your really lovely article. That's just great. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so let me ask you, um, you know where where do we go from here given given the uh the published algorithm and its its applications are is there extensions to you know picking up a main trend and perhaps a couple of sub trends or um things along those lines so so where do we go from here uh given given the current algorithm Thank you. Um, so uh, there are two possible avenues, uh, we uh, two possible things we can do. Uh, the first is uh, more algorithmic related and the second is more uh, data related. Okay. So in terms of the algorithm, uh, a major limitation of our tool is that we're able, it's designed to detect one dimensional sequences, one dimensional trends. This is exactly what you asked. So what happens if we have a two dimensional trend. What happens if we have two uh, leading parameters or one more important and one less important in the data? What should we do in this case? And we started uh, addressing this issue and we even have a Jupyter notebook on our GitHub showing uh, what can be done in this case, yeah. where basically we we have a method with which we can detect uh, the leading trend strip it from the data and then apply the sequencer again. Yep. So we're doing something like this, but I'm sure that it can be improved. Uh, this is sort of a way to do that using uh, the tool that we have so far. Right. But the question is whether we can uh, do something more generic mm -hmm. in terms of the dimensionality of the resulting uh, embedding. So mm -hmm. the sequencer is a dimensionality reduction algorithm that is only capable uh, of embedding the data set into a single dimension. Right. Whereas TCNE and UMAP can embed the data set into 2D uh, and 3D, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so there are ways uh, 
to examine the structure of the minimum spanning tree and not reduce it into a single quantity of major axis uh, divided by minor axis, so the elongation. We can examine the structure of the minimum spanning tree in uh, a much more generic way. What happens if I have a fork, if I start with a sequence and then it breaks yeah. into two different uh, components, for example? What happens if I have a circle? There are all sorts of interesting topological structures yes. that can teach me something extremely interesting about the deficit. Yes. So this is one uh, type of things we're thinking about and very excited about. Oh. And the second thing uh, is actually applying the sequencer to data sets. Uh, so we had these uh, two results. I'm now collaborating with two teams of uh, neuroscientists uh, in trying to apply the sequencer mm. to their data sets. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is the coolest part about uh, developing machine learning algorithms and statistical tools in astronomy, because then you can work with geologists and with chemists and with neuroscientists, and you can learn a bunch of things about what they're doing. Um, so it's really, really interesting and cool. So I hope that uh, it will uh, result in something interesting. We're in very early stages of testing. Um, so I don't know whether we will be able to find something interesting there. Future is bright for this one. Very cool. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. All right. Dali, I want to thank you once more, once more for uh, walking us through your really lovely paper. And that will do it for this one, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy or your geology or your chemistry or your neuroscience day just a little bit better. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you, Frank. Bye.